Welcome to the Feminist AF Podcast, where we encourage women to be unapologetically themselves, to take up more space in the world, and to embrace being too much. I'm your host, Jenny Manpa. I'm a licensed clinical therapist, women's leadership coach, and published author. I began my social work career working in juvenile justice, victims advocacy, and community mental health, which highlighted for me how many social issues disproportionately affect women. I found myself trying to do everything and do it perfectly, and all that got me was burned out before I even hit 30. I knew something had to change, so I dug deep into figuring out my own value system, and from there, I founded my own private practice called Forward and Heels, which helps women learn to excel at what they do and stand tall so they can light up the world. Each week, you'll hear from women who are kicking ass, lifting other women up, and changing the status quo. As a quick but important legal disclaimer, this podcast is not therapy. This is for entertainment and discussion purposes only. If you are seeking therapy, please seek out a licensed therapist that you enter into a HIPAA-protected agreement with for treatment. Thanks for joining me, and now let's get feminist as fuck. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am so excited to talk with my guest. I mean, I talk with her all the time in real life, but on the show so you can listen to us. Hera Z is a social media marketer and sales funnel strategist. She's also fucking brilliant and does all of my social media. And so if you're impressed by anything, that's why. Hera, welcome to the show. What's up, girl? How you doing? <laughs> I'm so excited. So we were introduced by another female badass powerhouse, Jess, who will be on the show in a couple of weeks. And I just love that we're all part of this like large community that's like getting shit done and doing work in addition to being like uplifting and loving. So that's how we know each other. And you are just an absolute genius in social media. How did you get to be this genius? Where did you start? How did you get here? Oh, that's a good question. So the strategy that we kind of worked on for you is literally my obsession of when I was an online coach and I needed to figure my shit out. It's like, you're online, you have a business online. How are you going to make sales? So that's how it started. It was my own need to Mm -hmm. make sales. (laughs) Yeah, that totally resonates with me because that's basically why I became the therapist I am. I was like, my 20s were fucking rocky as hell and there was no one there to guide me and I just pieced together all this insight and information and after all this time, I was like, hey, I bet I'm not the only one who feels this way. Mm -hmm. That sounds about how every successful entrepreneur starts. (laughs) That makes sense. And I think we talk, you and I, a lot about authenticity. And I know that's sort of a buzzword that gets thrown around, but I think it's exactly what we're talking about, which is I became something that I needed but didn't have. You became something that you were like, hey, I'm starting something and uh, I'm missing this piece. I guess I'll just figure it out myself. And that's the authenticity of being like, we've walked this path already. Yeah, for sure. And it's, I love to hear you talk about values. That was, that was when I fell in love completely. (laughs) And I love to hear you talk about values. And that's something that you saw in your strategy too, right? Talking about the psychology driven brand and authenticity is a big piece of that big piece. Yeah. I was uh, just recording an episode earlier with someone who is a dating coach. And she was talking about how there's this reckoning of these white women in coaching who had been these like top of the game. And they're people that you and I have talked about. So like Marie Forleo, Rachel Hollis, like people who didn't have a lot of substance behind their hype. And now it's sort of crumbling down around them in a lot of ways. Hype. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of that hype out there on social media, isn't there? And like, look, hype can be great, right? If you're out there cheering on your friends and women you've never met, that's amazing. But when your whole brand is built on follow me and I'll teach you how to have a perfect life, I'm always like, you definitely can't have a perfect life because none of us can. So if that's what you're selling me, I sniff out some snake oil. I love it. I, I'm obsessed with you. I can't even, it's the way that you describe things just makes my heart go pitter patter. And I'll tell you between the authenticity and hype. Yes. But to one thing that you and I are about, and again, why I fell in love with you, it's about results. How are you going to take me from point A to point Z? How are you going to get me there and hype me up along the way? But I want results. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. You can have all the hype in the world, but if it's not bringing you anywhere, it's just fluff. And you can also have results without any joy, which I think is something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. I have this new thing that I'm doing where I'm ending the show on champagne wins. And it's something I do with my therapist because we tend to be so focused on the problems and the crises and where the functioning is malfunctioning. And I want them to say like, also I kicked ass in this way and Mm -hmm. I did this great thing this week. So I think 
hype without results is fluff, but results without hype is just like sad nose to the grindstone work without any joy. It's so true. It's so true. I just turned 40 and the joy piece is number one for me right now. Um, Congratulations, Mazel. I heard 40s are amazing. They are. (laughs) Did you turn 40 in quarantine? Did you have a non-party? So I'm kind of blessed in the sense that on the day of my birth this year in quarantine, they opened up open air dining. So I felt like the chosen one. (laughs) I did get to go out and have this open air dining experience. It wasn't the 40th birthday that I thought. However, it is what it is. I mm-hmm. still think 2020 is amazeballs and I'll just celebrate 41 the way I wanted to celebrate 40. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. And I love that perspective. It's like, it's that yes and, right? Like 2020 does not look like any of us anticipated. And I know that I'm saying this from a place of privilege and that I continue to be employed. I continue to have a roof over my head and all the things that make a life livable. But there is so much possibility and opportunity in 2020, in quarantine, in COVID, in the strife that's happening right now, things can be built from it. And I think back to our conversation about results, you can either be weighed down by everything that's different and isn't like what it was before, or you can examine, do I really want to go back to what it was before? Was I living my very best, most fulfilling life? If the answer is no in any way, what can you do? What opportunity do you have now that you didn't have six months ago? Yeah, that is exactly how I feel about 2020. Like speaking from a place of privilege, I feel super blessed, super grateful to even have that perspective. And I think when I read Forward in Heels, that was when to me really getting like familiar with my values. So you triggered it and you sent it, you sent me down a rabbit hole that has just, I think is going to catapult my 40s into something amazing. But it's 2020 has kind of slowed down and really given a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of our clients, and most certainly myself, the chance to look at exactly what you just said. Like, how have we been living? How do we want to live? I remember in March when we got shut down, April rolled around and that was the thought that came to my brain was, whoa, do I want to continue going at this pace that I've been going, this hard grind, work harder to achieve your dreams, or do I want to reassess the way I live? Because I thought the quarantine would be over in a matter of weeks. Uh So I got real present, (laughs) real (laughs) present. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm thinking about some of my clients who really struggled at the beginning of quarantine. And I have one that is in mind where she said in like May, she was like, you know what I've realized? I spent all my time in New York before going to bars, going to restaurants, going to concerts, going to events because I wanted to meet someone. And you know what I realized? I fucking hate bars. She's like, I hate bars. I hate concerts. I hate groups of people. What was I doing? But it was because it was what I was supposed to do to meet someone. And Mm -hmm. she's like, now that I'm quarantined in a totally different place than New York, and I'm really stuck here with my own thoughts, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to drill down on my values. And she didn't exactly say it that way, but like, who do I want in my life? How do I manifest the person, not stick myself in a situation and hope for the best? Hmm. I think it's so important to have that level of self-awareness, do we want to call it, right? Like, Mm -hmm. is that the right word? Because that's what it feels like. It feels like this level of self-study and self-awareness is just, it's so powerful. I like that term self-study because I think self-awareness implies passivity. I just know who I am, but self-study, like how do we get to know who we are except through intentional work? Yeah, intentional work, questioning, reflectiveness. There was a coach that was talking about carving out a thinking hour every day in in your daily life. And if I tell you in 2019, if you told me to carve out a thinking hour, I would have laughed in your face. (laughs) I just made a face. (laughs) I'm still there. (laughs) Well, now I'm just like, oh my God, Mondays, I don't do any, you're my first call on Mondays because Mondays (laughs) I block off my schedule. Fridays I cut out at one and it's like, oh, there's time to just think and yeah, study. That's the Mm -hmm. word, self-study. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I love that you said that about your schedule. We're such soulmates because that is literally how I schedule my weeks. I'm like, Mondays we ease in, Fridays we off ramp, and then we go hard Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yes, but somehow you and I always email each other on Sundays. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. We're, I, I think you and I are probably actually very bad at downtime, which is why we have to build it in, right? Many people don't have to build in a thinking hour. It's those us type A's that are like, okay, I have to schedule in thinking time. <laughs> yeah. 
And we do. And it's and blocked off on the calendar, the color coded calendar. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A friend of mine tweeted or Instagrammed or something. She was like, she'd been listening to a panel or a podcast or something. And she said that the person recommended if you're not reading as many books as you wanted to in quarantine to like put it in your schedule, like a meeting. And I was like, oh, I've been doing that my whole life. Like I have to build in leisure reading. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was a, at the beginning of quarantine, that funny meme that was like, okay, introverts have been prepared for quarantine <laughs> their entire life. And as much as I'm one of those, right, ambiverts, whatever that means, if that's even a real term, but totally love my downtime, totally love my people time. And f- being 40, this whole self-study is where it's at right now. I'm reading um, Joe Dispenza, that Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Have you read Ooh, that? I haven't. Mm, girl. Okay. Yeah. It's on the list. Yeah. It, it goes into my scheduled reading time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I have all the other books that you recommended me too among boundaries. I mean, I have a whole list. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. I met this woman in a bar right before, well, I wouldn't say right before quarantine, but in the before times. And she is a medium and a psychic. Mm-hmm. And she was like, there's a reason it's called human being. It's an active verb. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. I didn't think about that ever. You know, we take so much language for granted. Yeah, it's true. We do. Yeah. And you are also a yoga instructor, yes? I'm a certified yoga instructor. I don't teach it actively, but getting certified has absolutely, I mean, it's become part of who I am, those yogic principles. So, yep, I'm certified. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And how do you feel like being really well-versed in the, I don't know if methodology is the right word, but in that world prepared you or allowed you to exist and experience quarantine in a way that wasn't just to knock you on your ass? I kind of feel like it was almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's part of that self-study. It's part of being able to sit with your thoughts and observe them as opposed to judge them and let them freak you out. And it gave me a little bit of more of a playful attitude when it came to noticing my thoughts and just not thinking like, oh my God, I'm having this thought and I'm having this emotion and it's the end of the world. It's just not. So yoga helped a lot. Mm -hmm. How long have you been practicing? Um, 2000 and well, 2008, my mom passed away. Mm. I did therapy for the first time in my life right after that because I was cursing a lot. (laughs) Like, I mean, I curse quite a bit, but I noticed after my mom had passed away that my cursing, like actual words coming out of my mouth that shouldn't be said around children were just coming out at a ridiculous (laughs) rate. Yeah. Maybe that's anger. I don't know what that (laughs) is. Went to a therapist. The number one lesson I learned from her was, well, two lessons. One, people are like natural disasters, aka hurricanes and floods, and they cannot be controlled. (laughs) And the other one, I mean, that's a bit intense, but it (laughs) sense to me at the time. And the other one was about all about boundaries, all about boundaries, because I really had none growing up. So two with my parents, and that's another story for another time, but 2009, I started therapy, did it for a year, felt a close, and I said, I should do yoga. And I should get certified for myself, not for anything else. So probably around 2009, 2010, 10 or 11 years. And that was how I actually became an online entrepreneur. I saw this woman certifying us. My brain always thinks in terms of like, how do I make another stream of income? How do I do that? (laughs) But uh, I did an online yoga community. I took what she was teaching us. I put it online and that's where we were talking about trademarks and everything. But 11 years as a yogi. Wow. Still going? Still. Yeah. Yeah. There's such a, uh, I think there's a lot of like Western sort of co-opting of yoga. They teach it at every crunch gym in New York sports club without any nod to the millennia old heritage of it and how it's really connected to the world and spirituality. And I think that with doing the true training for yourself, you Mm -hmm. really probably dove deeply into the connectedness to nature and the earth and spirituality and things that we can't even see or conceptualize but exist around us, as opposed to simply the practice of yoga, which is like doing downward dog for 10 minutes. And so I'm curious, like in times 
since 2008, 2009, 2010, right? We've had the Great Recession. We've had the 2016 election, which I will only speak for myself, was an absolutely traumatizing time and continues to be. We are in another recession. We are in the middle of protests. Like, how have you felt that, especially noticing that 10 years ago, you were you had a, an experience in your life that brought up some anger for you, understandably. How has that flowed into the next 10 years, or I guess past 10 years to right now of really, you said like letting yourself feel a th- like hear a thought or feel an emotion and not be completely just stuck in it or overwhelmed by it, even though other people are hurricanes, right? They absolutely cannot be controlled. Like how has that shown up for you? And that's a really interesting question because I think sometimes I actually get a little bit of pushback from it where for me, it comes up as a feeling of non-attachment and that's a yogic principle of non-attachment to whereas there are a lot of people that feel very attached and they feel a lot of emotions to things that go on outside of them. And for me, it just depends, it depends on the situation. I can tell you for sure this past June with the whole Black Lives Matter movement, that hit me hard. Mm -hmm. That hit me hard. And that sense of a month at a minimum of deep reflection, but just constantly reminding myself to not be attached because the yoga that I studied, you're right. Like I like that you brought up the whole crunch gym and what happens there. Like I had a yoga instructor once tell me to push harder. (laughs) That's not yoga, babe. (laughs) No, I'm not going to. I'm going to lay here actually and let you push harder and I'm going to honor what's going on for me in this body. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I think that's a really good question because that's how it shows up on the outside. Sometimes it's like, don't you care? And it's like, well, of course I care, but I'm I'm just observing how I feel and I'm not reacting. I'm thinking about it so I can decide how I want to respond and move forward with my day and what impact and what change and what actions do I want to be responsible for or carry out. So interesting because I think part of what you're saying is better boundaries, but I don't think you would have necessarily, or most people would have connected that being more present and physically in your body actually allows you to set those boundaries with other people better because you know where you're grounded and therefore where they're entering your space, where they're uninvited or unwelcome. It makes me think a lot about adjustments when instructors adjust physically. Mm -hmm. And I've been to so many yoga classes in my lifetime. And when someone understands trauma, understands the people in the room, understands that particularly women who tend to be the larger yogis in the classes I've been to, or I say more numerous, may not want you to come up behind them and touch them. And I actually had an experience years ago at a studio I really liked where it wasn't anything that I could pinpoint out loud or point to anything. I just didn't like this guy. I just did not like this instructor. And I did not like the way he did adjustments. And I thought that he invaded space in a way that was not respectful. And you can tell because when you say to someone like, oh, I'd rather not be adjusted, if they react negatively, then they have no respect and concept of your own bodily autonomy. And years later, I was talking to a new friend that I had met through like a women's networking group. And somehow we got on this topic and she's talking about this yoga studio, totally different neighborhood than where I worked, whatever. Long story short, this guy was working there and he, according to her, like got fired or there was at least put on leave because there was something inappropriate. And I was like, I fucking knew it. I knew it. And I didn't listen to myself because I felt like I was being dramatic and there was nothing I could point to that was evidence that there was something off about this guy. And so I just think there's something that you tune into with your body when you're really connecting in that way that yoga allows you to do that's different from like a hit class or cardio or running. Oh yeah, completely. And you're bringing up the the word that's coming to my head right there too, is that consent. Yeah. And when we were trained to teach classes, even though I never wanted to teach in public classes, we were taught, I mean, my yoga instructor, she was down in South Florida. Her name was Juliana Trejo, T-R-E-J-O, amazing woman. She taught us that. Like you can ask, there are ways that you can ask if people want to be adjusted. I mean, even ways that you end the class and words that could possibly trigger people. We did a few classes too for PTSD and veterans and all of that and little things like just the words that are coming up for me are just consent and being aware of other people's experiences are not necessarily yours. Mm -hmm. So tread with awareness. I don't want to say caution, but 
With awareness. Exactly. And too many people still even now think that boundaries are a wall to keep people out. Boundaries are just drawing your line in the sand and saying, this is where I'm at. And if you come up to this line, that's okay. You just can't come over it. But they're not intended to keep people out. They're intended to show mutual respect and reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you and I have this conversation that we both studied abroad or lived in Spain? Was it? No, because I did not. When I lived in Spain, when I first moved there, the personal space doesn't exist. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they would come straight up to your face and talk to you. And I was like, whoa, 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 what's happening? So it's, again, it's that awareness of different cultures, different backgrounds, different human beings. I personally think boundaries are awesome. Yeah, me too. Big fan. I have a, a, a good friend who, when I did go to Israel, she's Israeli. And after we met in the first iteration, we were, we'd seen each other again, like a year later. And she was talking about how in Israel, everyone is conscripted into the army. And it's something that everybody shares as an experience. And she talked about how, when she came, when she finished her army service, she just felt really like numb and disconnected. And when she tried to talk to someone about it, they'd be like, well, yeah, like everybody feels that way. And because everybody goes through that military experience, there was almost like a dismissal of the PTSD and the experience of being a veteran. And she, you just, reminded me of it because she, in some ways, Israeli culture is so, so direct, and but she still couldn't get through to people to talk about this, and so she felt really alone, and she went to Spain for 10 days just to be by herself and had like a full-on breakdown because finally people were like in her space, not in a negative way, but in a way where she was finally able to access why she was feeling so disconnected and numb from herself and realized that she had PTSD, but nobody talked about it because everybody went through it. Wow. That's amazing, huh? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually just reading this book on trauma. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's just this body of research about something called complex trauma or complex PTSD, which is not a diagnosable or it's not in the DSM for mental health providers out there. But it basically is like if you grow up in poverty and there is a lot of like police presence in your life, those are considered like complex trauma experiences because they're ongoing. If you grow up with a lot of abuse, if you grow up being food insecure and not knowing that you're going to eat, like these, because we think of trauma as a one-time thing. You were assaulted, you were in war, but the war's over, or at least you've left it. And there isn't a lot that we talk about with what it means to then have that trauma travel with you for the rest of your life and how disconnected you can become physically from your body to not even understand like how emotions work. And yoga is one of the number one things. And again, with a lot lot of setup and a lot of intentional like explaining of how it's going to work and what an adjustment might look like and that you don't have to close your eyes and not calling it corpse pose and all these things that can make it one of the best ways for people who've been almost disembodied from themselves because of their trauma to come back into their body and feel things. Yes, yes, this is what we taught. And that was even down to um and it just came up yesterday too. Sometimes I swear I'm psychic. <laughs> it was Right? Like something will happen one day and you'll just think of it the day before. Yep. We weren't supposed to say, now take your last breath. Oh. Because it was like, whoa, that's, yeah. that, that could be really intense for somebody. For sure. Yeah. Even you just saying it now, I'm like, whoa, that's heavy. Same. Same. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So shifting gears a little bit, you are named for a goddess. Let's yeah. talk about that. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. My mom did it. My mom <laughs> She named me after goddess of women, queen of the gods. Is that feminist AF? I think it is, right? I think it definitely is. I'm curious, like growing up, obviously you must have never been able to find like one of those kitschy license plates with your name on it at the like convenience store or the keychains. When it goes through like the Sarah and the Brian, you're like, nope, no Hera? Okay. So I'm curious, like if growing up with this name, did you always know it was the goddess of women? And did you always know that there was sort of mythology tied up in it? I did. And you're so spot on with, I honestly wish my name were something different. Like I would have paid to be Nicole or right, Jennifer, mm -hmm. something, give me something to be like everybody else. But I knew it was different and I felt weird. It made me feel weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard to be different in any way as a kid. Was there a period of time where that evolved for you, where you leaned into it and you really embraced your individuality or did it stick with you for a long time that you were not like other people? 
<sighs> well, I'm going to be brutally honest. The way I embraced it, I don't know if we can call it embracing it. I think I went the rebellious route and it was like, well, if they won't let me join them, then I'm going to beat them. Mm-hmm. And I was actually a little bully. <laughs> oh, no. It's okay. We, we can only do with what we can now. So you're going to go back and apologize to those little girls. <laughs> oh, I did. I did. Yeah. I don't know why. They, I mean, I see them all on Facebook, right? We went through that. We're, I'm 40. We're 40 now. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm forgiven. Yeah. No, I think we all were. I think we could get into so much childhood of just how kids attempt to develop an identity and a uniqueness. And that when you, I think you're absolutely like saying it so succinctly, which is you either try so hard to to blend in like Barack Obama going by Barry, or you just roll with it because you can't change it in some ways, or you can try, but it's just going to be inauthentic to what we're talking about before. So, so what did that look like for you becoming this like little ball buster, this like little strong feminist, whether you knew it or not, like what was little five and 10 year old Tara like? Uh, I lived in my own world. That is for sure. I think that there was too. Like I grew up very, she's, oh, she's different. Oh, she's not this religion. She doesn't live in this area of the neighborhood. So I think I was just a little meanie, but I thought I was the shit because my mom told me so. My mom, like kids that grow up where it's like, you can do anything and be anything and you're God's gift to this earth. Yeah, it's me and you. (laughs) Yeah, our our parents think that. I personally, my experience just didn't. I didn't fit in. So I created my own world and I marched to the beat of my own drum and I never pictured myself getting married, having a boyfriend, none of that. It was always like, I'm just going to rule the world alone. I don't, Mm -hmm. that was how it kind of came out when I was little. And I guess I started playing more by the rules. I don't think I still do. I don't know. (laughs) What are rules? What? Boundaries? Uh. Yes. Rules? Huh? A hundred percent. Yes. And it's such an important distinction between them. Rules are like, you're not allowed to. Boundaries are, this is my value and I invite you to respect it. Yeah. Rules are meant to be questioned and then we decide if we want to follow. How's that sound? I like it. (laughs) Have you ever read any Gretchen Rubin, like the four tendencies? Um, yes. Did we talk about this? Cause you have to be, we're a rebel. I'm a rebel. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'm somewhere between rebel and questioner. Like if a rule makes sense to me, but, and you've explained it to me and I'm bought in, I will follow it. But if you just tell me this is how we do it, I'm like, hell no. Yes. 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 I have this conversation and I don't know how anybody feels about it, but I think our, this audience will agree, right? The whole ma- wearing a mask. It's like, okay, I will wear a mask to protect somebody else. That makes sense. I will wear the mask period. It's good. I ask my questions. I'm okay. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's such a good concrete example because I think sometimes when we get into talking about like, what's your tendency, it can seem very woo woo and conceptual. Like that's a perfect example. Like we wear masks because science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also a little bit of, or a lot of it out of respect of those boundaries and other people's preferences and awareness of what's going on with them. Like even the biggest thing I would hear people say, (laughs) <laughs> why are these idiots wearing masks in the car? And it's like, you have no idea. Why are you laughing at them? Yep. Yeah. You know, you don't know. You don't know. So. Yep. Yeah. And, and on a, a bit of a serious note, as we're recording this, the actor Chadwick Boseman just died and he's only 43 and media had been making fun of him for losing weight in the last couple of years. And it's because he had colon cancer. He was stage four by the end. And you don't need to know why somebody else is doing something. If it's not harming you, let them be. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to know what I'm feeling really called to flip that too, that Other people don't need to know why you're doing something. That was a big realization for me last year where it was like, I don't need to explain myself to other people. And that was an internal need that I placed on myself, just assuming that people needed to hear my reasons why I chose, why I did, why I, no, honey. That's super interesting. How did you start to notice that in a really active way? And what did you do to make that change? So, right. So first you start noticing last year and you're like, oh, I'm maybe justifying is the word like a lot to other people. And then how did you work your way out of doing it as much? I'm sure you probably still do it sometimes, but what was that journey like? It was, it was a lot of suffering, right? And I think that word suffering can have so many different meanings, but let's talk about the word suffering, meaning stress 
and noticing that you're having these really, that I was having these really intense, long explanatory, is that a word, uh-huh. right? Explanations of why I did this way. And it was like, I am spending so much energy explaining myself and it's just not necessary. And the question, and I deemed it not necessary after the reflection, but the question became, I think that this person thinks this and is that true? Well, I'm not sure. Let me ask that person. So it's just like, again, it's that self-study, that thinking, reflecting, and questioning the truth and validity of things. And did we make it up in our head? Or is it actual fact according to a conversation we've had with this other person? Mm -hmm. I'm such a big fan of evidence. Like our brains can tell us so many things and usually it's to protect us. And so using your example, like, oh, is that person mad at me? Well, then I should defend myself. And it's like, what's the evidence? What have they actually said objectively that supports this assertion on my end? And if not, what if I assume that they're not? And what if I operate as if everything's fine? Maybe that makes everything fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was assuming a lot and I was looking for a lot of validation and it just didn't seem like it was serving me. Like I I had a lot of physical evidence to it, right? Headaches and low energy and getting sick and all this. And to me, I mean, we were speaking about the body a little bit before, right? But the body, the, if you, for me and my belief, right? If you are experiencing some sort of sickness or an ache or a pain or headaches or no energy, something's off because you should be living. I would like to be living and I believe that I can live in a state of joy and full out energy and feeling in a state of ease. So if I'm not feeling that, then that means I'm resisting something or I'm, something's kind of off. So Mm -hmm. I reflect and that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, our bodies are such bearers of our emotions. And we, in the Western world, at least we've so disconnected the two, but there's a reason that all of our expressions of stress and fear and anger are bodily, right? I had a lump in my throat, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, my stomach dropped. It's all bodily. And we just disconnect them from the emotions. You might really like this Joe Dispenza book because it talks about how the feelings, the thoughts create these feelings and the feelings send out these chemicals and we then immediately feel it in our body. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. The thing that keeps coming up for my clients, especially in quarantine is this like lethargic staying in bed, especially if you, I mean, whether you're working from home or not working, or especially if you have like a roommate or a partner and you don't have a lot of space and you didn't plan for this because you used to have an office, talk to them a lot about how when you're feeling that sluggishness, not necessarily like full-blown clinical depression chemically, but when you're feeling this, I'll call it lowercase d depression, like low grade, the kind that we've all experienced, we Mm -hmm. often think like, I need to get motivated and then I'll go do something. But actually it's a really a little bit fake it till you make it where it's like, get up, get out of bed, put on some clothes, put on makeup if that's what makes you feel good. Don't if it doesn't and do something. And then your brain actually catches up and says, oh, I thought we were sick because I was feeling like low energy. So I told you to stay in bed because we didn't want to get sicker or to infect somebody else. Now that we're up and out of bed, it turns out I I realize we're not sick, so I'm catching up. And so, so much of it has to be action first and then the thoughts and feelings follow, but we get stuck in the opposite. Yeah. It's so powerful to understand the brain and the mind, really. Yep. And there is so much that we don't know. And I don't know that we will for a long time. And so I think back to what you were saying, like, we don't necessarily have to understand someone else or to have someone understand us to accept that we are operating the way we're operating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. So little Hara is this like, go for it ahead of the curve. Was it a conscious choice to get into marketing, which is a totally male dominated industry or did it kind of happen? And then it turned out you were really good at it. What was that journey like? It was actually an accident. It was tough. <laughs> it's funny that you asked me that way. Cause it's, I put a story up and I just wrote, rewrote this story again to reintroduce myself, which any, anybody who's listening, who's a business owner, you want to reintroduce yourself and your brand frequently on your social media channels because people, they want to feel connected to you and you want to connect to your audience. It was a total accident. It was, again, by need. I had a business. The business was online. The first one, which was the yoga community, completely failed because I knew nothing about marketing. 
I got a second chance actually in a network marketing company, right? Which I have huge respect for them. They, you do know what network marketing is? I don't know nope. if everyone knows. <laughs> network, nope. mar- network marketing, very negative tone gets called a pyramid scheme. Ah. In a positive tone, like Beachbody is an example. That was actually the one that I was involved in was Beachbody. So we were helping people work out. We were helping them with their nutrition. A lot of network marketers get into that and they do it the wrong way. They try and sell everything to everybody. And I wasn't that way. I believe truly in helping people have a better quality of life. So it went really well for me. Beachbody was, I, that was how I left teaching. I was a teacher. And Beachbody was very good at teaching you how to show up on social media and how to serve people. It was a, an incredible network marketing company. But I took it to a completely different level to where I hired a mentor that taught me how to build a funnel. And I, we're not going to get into what a funnel is necessarily, but just mm-hmm. know that if you have a business, you need one. And he, I paid eight grand to learn how to build this funnel. And then I decided, okay, well, I don't want to do it myself. So I'm going to hire somebody to do it. And that person I hired ended up becoming my partner to build this agency. And you learn as you go and you work with clients. And I am a total researcher. So mm-hmm. When I want to get a result for somebody, I will exhaust every path and possibility out there. And I think I'm pretty good at marketing because I go to this extent of, we are going to explore all the things and the best one is going to be the strategy that you utilize. Mm. But yeah, it was a total accident. And there are, there's a lot of men, a lot of men in marketing, which I don't know why, because women, like we're the ones that spend all the money, right? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, we could have a whole separate conversation about this, that yeah. we women are the ones being sold to. Yeah, correct. So yeah. We, just, we just hired also uh, two more female copywriters because we want that women's voice into the copywriting and the ads and all of that. And especially when you talk about emotions, I think that feminine energy is much more tapped into their emotions normally than men, although I really love a man who can talk feelings and <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, total accident coming into marketing. That's so funny. So I'm curious, I don't know a lot about marketing. I mean, that's why I have you. But the industry, I know what it looks like when male dominated industries are like go nose to the grindstone. And I'm curious, like you and I align on this, which is that working like hard doesn't have to be hard. Like it can be smart. It can be strategic. You can outsource, you can build a system that works for you. And so I'm curious, how do you build in? Cause like you and I joked before that despite trying to set boundaries for ourselves, we're still sending emails on Sundays, just pretending that we're not working. How do you as an entrepreneur and as a solopreneur in some ways, yes, you have a team, but like for you yourself, like you care about your product and your craft, you care about your service. How do you, I don't want to say turn it off, but how do you set those time boundaries for yourself? And how do you let your brain do other things? I find that I just keep coming back to work, whatever I'm conceptualizing work as. Mm -hmm. And I think the smartest thing that I did was just say, okay, these are the tasks that feel like work. Let me prioritize them, let me complete them. And then there are parts of my, of my career and we'll call it the zone of genius or things that like emailing you on a Sunday doesn't feel like work. So it doesn't drain my energy. So we have those energy draining tasks perhaps, or the ones that require a little bit of output on my part. And then other things like even going through branding. And when we were talking about the psychology driven brand, that stuff fuels me. So I think it just kind of was wise for me to decide what are the things that will kind of deplete, I don't want to say deplete, but just kind of take from my tank, like require some fuel and then the others that kind of fill it back up. Mm -hmm. And I just have a nice balance of that. And I think when you've been in the online industry for over 10 years, you get to a point where you have a base of that passive income and things start to become a little bit more joyful and more, you have more of an option of what you take on and what you don't. Yeah. So that was important. And that took time, obviously, right? 10 years to get there. But I think what I see a lot of, and I I hate to just peg this on men, but that type of hardcore go energy is like casting the widest net possible, spreading yourself thin, seeing what sticks and let's just 
not sleep and not enjoy our relationship. I won't anymore. I'm mm-hmm. done with that. <laughs> yeah. I won't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if there's one thing that, I mean, quarantine has taught us a lot of lessons, but I think if there's one thing that I just see coming up over and over again, it's that like we're stuck with our own thoughts 24 seven right now. There are no distractions of going out to this play or this movie or or just being out in the world surrounded by people. It's like we are, whatever we're doing, whether we are going to an office or going to work or going outside, like it's a very different world. And I don't want to live in a world that looks like this in 2020 in quarantine with all the uncertainty and hate my job. Yeah. And you want to know what? And I bet you that's probably what really drove it home for me was this is a time where we may actually never get back. And some people and are probably hoping and myself a little bit too, like, no, I don't want there to be a pandemic. I don't want people's lives to be at stake and I don't want people's businesses shut down, but what can I take from this moment? That's beautiful. And it really shifted me towards honoring my relationships and my rest because we kind of did need those boundaries, Mm -hmm. right? The, The separation of, okay, I always work from home, but something's different here. This is like all encompassing. So there had to be a line drawn where something had to shift. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of joy, I have a new practice. I've been doing it with my therapist for a long time in the ones that I supervise. And it occurred to me that like, I want to do it here too. So I want to celebrate champagne wins. And champagne wins are the things that you feel weird bragging about to a non-entrepreneur or even your friends or even your partner. Or like with my therapist, sometimes the champagne win is like this like really intense emotional reaction that a client had, but like we know that it's a good thing. But if you told it to your non-therapist friend or partner, they'd be like, I think you broke them. And so like, what is the win that you want to share that is going really well or you feel weird sharing with anybody else, but I'm demanding you do it here. Uh, Well, since since you're demanding, I wonder, okay, okay, you're demanding. Um, I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to be honest because there's strength in that, right? Yep. Um, I think a lot of people really don't like to talk about money or hear about money. And we're making some like wildly amazing passive streams of income. And I'm going to celebrate it here with the champagne toast. So that way more people decide that they can have that for themselves too. (laughs) Hell yes. That's the thing about champagne wins is that they just show somebody else they can do it too. It's not bragging and saying, I did it and you can't. It's so can you. I'll help you. I swear. This is what I do. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Share more of that too. There's, I I consider myself actually quite a bit of woo, 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 right? And that's where (laughs) The rest and the reflection come in because I really truly think if we want to get woo, I think that's how we manifest slash create slash come up with the next move. It's all the same. But that woo part of me is like, okay, if I talk about it and I put it out there, that's, that's good. Other people will have it too. And if you notice that somebody else is triggering something in you, like, ugh, bitch, right? Passive income, like she's bragging. No, do you want to know what it is? It's you actually saying, I'm capable of that too, but I don't have it. So you feel that contrast. But if you turn and pivot more towards the, I'm capable of that too. Now, maybe I should connect with her and see how she does that. Or maybe I should start exploring how I can do that too, because you're seeing it's possible for yourself. So I think the champagne wins are amazing because it allows you to see by paying attention, right? What, what do you feel when somebody says, I got another stream of passive income. What? <laughs> Billionaires have 15 streams. I'm working my way up to being a billionaire. <laughs> what, is, what does that make you feel, right? When you hear it, because if it makes you feel anything other than like, fuck yes, <laughs> then <laughs> you may or may not want to just kind of reflect and see, does that feeling, what is that feeling? And if you feel any type of negative way, it really actually means that you see that as possible for yourself, but you just haven't taken the steps towards it yet. Yes. Oh my gosh. 100% cosign everything you said. Perfectly okay. said. Won't even try to summarize it because it was amazing. Tara, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. You are a joy. I love that that's the word that kept coming up throughout this call because that's exactly how I see you. And mm-hmm. so people are going to reach out to you because I'm telling you guys, She sent me like a 30 page marketing plan. I don't even know where to begin. I do know where to begin because she's given me a roadmap, but I am seriously like I could use this for the rest of my life and always have new content. So seriously, she's a genius. Where can people find you? 
on Instagram all day, every day. <laughs> I'm obsessed. So Herazee, I'm Herazee everywhere. So H-E-R-A-Z-E-E -E -E over on Instagram. Come holler at me. See, aren't you glad you have a unique name now? People can just find you. Oh, I love it now. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. You're the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you took something away from this conversation and don't forget to stay feminist as fuck by being unapologetically yourself, taking up more space in the world and embracing being too much. If you like what you heard today, please rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. <laughs>